Eight years after President Trump did not collude with the Russians, seven years after President Trump did not call neo-Nazis very fine people, after so many Democrat hoaxes over the years, the libs have landed on a new one for 2024, that Trump is going to cause a bloodbath. We just have to win this election because he's even predicting a bloodbath. What does that mean? He's going to exact a bloodbath? There's something wrong here. How um, respectful I am of the American people and their goodness. But how much more do they have to see from him to understand that this isn't what our country is about? Sounds really scary. Is he going to exact a bloodbath? Sounds like the sort of thing that's completely out of character for Donald Trump. Sounds like the sort of thing that's being alleged by Nancy Pelosi, who has been allergic to the truth for many, many years now. So I'm I'm just not sure I I really believe Pelosi's characterization of Trump's comments. What did Trump actually say? Mexico has taken over a period of 30 years, 34% of the automobile manufacturing business in our country. Think of it, went to Mexico. China now is building a couple of massive plants where they're going to build the cars in Mexico and think, they think, that they're going to sell those cars into the United States with no tax at the border. Let me tell you something to China. If you're listening, President Xi, and you and I are friends, but he understands the way I deal, those big monster car manufacturing plants that you're building in Mexico right now, and you think you're going to get that, you're going to not hire Americans, and you're going to sell the cars to us now, We're going to put a 100% tariff on every single car that comes across the line. And you're not going to be able to sell those cars if I get elected. Now, if I don't get elected, it's going to be a bloodbath for the whole. That's going to be the least of it. It's going to be a bloodbath for the country. That'll be the least of it. But they're not going to sell those cars. They're building massive factories. Okay, you heard it. You heard it straight from the president's mouth. Does that sound like Trump is threatening to massacre people? I don't think so. I don't think any honest person would conclude that that is the meaning of Trump's comment. Seems to me he's probably speaking figuratively of what's going to happen if the Democrats keep running the country. Even if, I was trying to think, even if Pelosi's right, even if Trump is calling for a bloodbath as though this were a good thing, even if Donald Trump, the lovable tabloid figure who's been world famous for 40 years, who already served a full term as president, all without slaughtering anybody, even if he were inclined to inflict a bloodbath on people in the event of his loss, he obviously would not be able to do that because he wouldn't have any political power. In that case, the liberals would possess all the political power as they do now when, ironically, There already is a bloodbath, both figurative and literal, thanks to an intentionally opened border that has directly caused not only gang violence and murder, but the worst epidemic of mass poisoning in American history because of the fentanyl crisis that is being encouraged, not only not stopped, it's being encouraged by Joe Biden and the Democrats. As usual, the Democrat accusations here are confessions. One shudders to think what the libs will accuse Trump of next. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. Welcome back to the show a top legendary Democrat campaign strategist and consultant says that if the Democrats lose this election, it will be Israel's fault. (laughs) We'll get get into that in just a moment. First, though, get your smells and bells candle over at dailywear.com slash shop. This is a Lenten-specific candle. Uh, It smells like a 12th century monastery, if you ask me. Uh, We've already sold a bazillion of these candles. It's the most... uh, popular candle ever in the Daily Wire shop. And you can get yours now. I think we're still making them. I hope we're still making them. Dailywire.com slash shop. Get them before they're gone. The Democrats believe that they're in trouble. That is why they are 
becoming so hysterical and hyperbolic. But the reason that they're not totally melting down over 2024 is because they know that they can control the media cycles. They know that Trump makes some totally anodyne comment in a speech about car manufacturing. And then Nancy Pelosi gets to go on CNN and say, he's going to slaughter everybody. It'll be a bloodbath. And then all the liberal outlets, they say, Donald Trump's going to kill us all. He's going to slaughter every single person. The bloodthirsty Democrats who, who never saw a baby they didn't want to slaughter. The, the Democrats who now are the party of wanting to go all over the world, bombing anybody they can find. The Republican Party quite clearly the party of life now uh, on a whole host of issues. We are supposedly going to slaughter everyone when we don't even have political power. I don't know how they make sense of that. But the libs can get away with it because they control the media. And Eric Holder, who is the attorney general for Barack Obama, just said that quiet part out loud. He, he just went on, I think it was, uh, uh, what was the show? Bill Maher's show, I think. Yeah, it was Bill Maher's show. And he said that uh, you don't need to worry about the polls right now, Democrats, because we got the media when we really need to change the narrative. We should not be too alarmed by these March polls. We've got to take them into consideration. But March is a fundamentally different month than October and November. And we'll see where these things turn out when we get to uh, that part of the calendar year. Hmm. Okay. But <laughs> I mean, the deal is I, 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 there's work to be I, done, but I'm actually optimistic that if we stay committed, focused, um, and as the media turns its attention to making this a binary choice between a person who's got some age and uh, cognitive issues, that would be Trump, against somebody who is actually, you know, against somebody who has actually accomplished a lot, I think we'll do just fine. Okay, I get it. You think he's talking about Biden. He's talking about Trump, even though no one really believes that. Even, even Bill Maher's frivolous audience there is only half applauding. Oh, yeah, right. Except Joe Biden can't pronounce his own name, and Donald Trump has more energy than he ever did. Uh, this is true. Not the conclusion, but the first part. He says, don't worry about the polls now. They're going to change when the media focus on this as a two-person race. When it's no longer Trump versus DeSantis versus Haley versus and Joe Biden with this weird Bobby Kennedy thing in the middle. When it really just comes down to Trump versus Biden, the media are going to totally change their coverage. They're all going to get in line. They're going to defend Joe Biden. And so you're going to see Joe Biden's negatives go down. You're going to see his positives go up. And, and you're going to see the race even out. That's probably true. It is the quiet part out loud. And a very prominent Democrat politician, Eric Holder, is admitting it. But it's, it's really all they've got left. They're saying, okay, the political realities for Biden are really bad. And when the media are not totally, constantly, actively carrying water for him, his approval ratings plummet and he's losing to Donald Trump in all the important swing states nationally by a significant margin. So the only way that we're possibly going to win this election is to have the media rig it. Even with the media being totally in Biden's pocket, even with Biden surrounding himself with the most sycophantic people he can find, things are looking pretty bad for him. Joe Biden was giving a speech on St. Paddy's Day. He had to tell the audience to clap. Ireland now is one of the top 10 investors in the United States economy, and our country stand, stand proudly for liberty and against tyranny. We stand together and oppose Russia's brutal war of aggression in Ukraine. You can clap for that, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's bad. It calls to mind an infamous moment of the 2016 race when Jeb Bush was up there in New Hampshire and he's going off about who knows what and the people don't do anything at the end and he says, please clap, and then they clap. Okay, and, and Joe Biden does almost the exact same thing here. However, what happened to Biden is actually worse than what happened to Jeb. Jeb is on the campaign trail during a very lively Republican primary in New Hampshire, where voters who might, maybe some voter supports Trump, maybe some voter supports Cruz, maybe some voter support, they can show up to the Jeb event and challenge him. So th that room you would expect to be much more hostile or potentially hostile than 
the White House, which is where Joe Biden was giving that speech. The only people in this room are people who support Joe Biden a lot, who have been vetted by the Biden political team a lot. And even in that room of the people most inclined to support this guy, he has to say, can you please clap for me? Uh, that was a good. And then, oh, yeah, sorry, sorry, sir. Yeah, right. Sorry, we fell asleep during your during your tirade. Really bad stuff. I Joe Biden right now is going to lose in Michigan, Arizona, Pennsylvania, North Carolina. He might lose the White House, though, is the problem. He might, if they did, if they took a, a poll of who people support in the Biden White House, I'm not sure the guy would win it right now. I'm being only slightly hyperbolic. The Democrats know this is a bad situation for them, and they have no other option. Now, if you feel that you were jilted of a good education, you do have another option. That is... Hillsdale. Go to hillsdale.edu slash Knowles. If you're a few years or even a few decades out of school and wondering, what did I learn and what was the point of it? First of all, you're not alone. Second of all, it's not too late. Hillsdale College is offering more than 40 free online courses. Learn about the works of C.S. Lewis, the rise and fall of the Roman Republic, or the history of the ancient church with Hillsdale College's online courses. If you're not sure where to start, check out C.S. Lewis on Christianity. In this seven-lecture course, you will examine some of Lewis's classic works, including Mere Christianity, The Screwtape Letters, and The Abolition of Man. You will also see what Lewis had to say about scripture, prayer, suffering, joy, heaven, and hell. The course is self-paced so that you can start whenever and wherever. Enroll in C.S. Lewis on Christianity to discover Lewis's core lessons on Christianity and how to apply faith to your life. Go to hillsdale.edu slash Knowles, K-N-W-L-E-S, to enroll. There is no cost. And it is easy to get started. That is hillsdale.edu slash Knowles, K-N-W-L-E-S, to enroll. Hillsdale.edu slash Knowles. The Democrats are already playing the blame game for what happens if Joe Biden loses. James Carville, probably the most famous Democrat strategist in America. He's up there with Axelrod. Probably Axelrod is the only one who's actually on his level. Maybe David Plouffe. Carville, though, much more colorful than all those guys. Carville, going back to the Clinton days, uh, he knows that things are bad for Biden, and he is not just blaming the border, and he's not just blaming the MAGA Republicans. He's pointing his finger at the state of Israel. This Gaza stuff, is, this is not just a problem with some snot-nosed Ivy League people. This is a problem all across the country, and I hope that the president and Blinken can get this thing calmed down because if it don't get calmed down before the Democratic convention, it, it, it's going to be a very ugly time in Chicago. I promise you that. They're going to have to tell BB Netanyahu, hey, dude, you're not, we're not going to lose our election because you're scared to go to jail. You got to think of something else because this, this, the negligence of this man was breathtaking. And why are we over there begging him? We ought to be putting pressure on him every way that you can to, to de escalate this thing and quickly. From the Democrat perspective, James Carville is totally right. He's 100% right about this. From the Democrat perspective. From the Republican perspective, sorry. <laughs> sorry, man. Yeah, you are right, James Carville, and that is very bad for you. I am not all that interested in the domestic politics of Israel, but the Democrats are because Israel is a major wedge issue for Democrats. Israel didn't used to be a major wedge issue for Democrats, but it is now because the Democrat base doesn't like the state of Israel. The elites in the Democrat party still basically like the state of Israel generally, but the Democrat base does not. The Democrat base goes campaigning for the pro-Palestine liberation movement. The Democrat base hates Israel because they view the Jews in Israel as white people even though a lot of them aren't white, but they, they say they're white and they hate white people. And they view the state of Israel as a colonial settler endeavor and they hate that and they hate it in America and they hate it when the Europeans do it and they hate it when the Jews do it too. And they just hate Israel, they hate it. And this is a big liability for the Democratic Party because the Democrats are in power right now and the Democrat base is angry that Biden isn't doing more to stop Israel from just chilling from just calming down with the bombing campaign. But from the Israeli perspective, from Netanyahu's perspective, they are looking at the October 7th massacre and they're saying this was 
a major attack on Israeli civilians, and we are not going to stop until the political threat from Hamas is neutralized in Gaza, and that's going to be brutal, and it's going to draw condemnation from basically everywhere in the world, but we're not going to stop, even if Joe Biden asks us really nicely. And you have a leader in Israel right now who's relatively rather right-wing, and so he's even less inclined to seek some kind of a diplomatic solution. So what's Biden going to do? You got James Carville there saying, hey, let's get those Israelis in line. Let's get them to cut it out. But they're not going to do it. Bibi Netanyahu's not going to listen to Joe Biden. So now what? So now you got to get the other Democrats involved. You get the senior most Democrat in the Senate, Chuck Schumer, who also happens to be Jewish, to come out and to say, hey, I've been a lifelong supporter of Israel. Obviously, I've got deep ties to the very idea of the nation of Israel, but I hate Netanyahu and he's got to go. Minister Netanyahu has lost his way by allowing his political survival to take the precedence over the best interests of Israel. He has put himself in coalition with far-right ex far -right extremists like Minister Smotrich and Ben Gavir. And as a result, he has been too willing to tolerate the civilian toll in Gaza, which is pushing support for Israel worldwide to historic lows. Israel cannot survive if it becomes a pariah. Prime Minister Netanyahu has also weakened Israel's political and moral fabric through his attempts to co-opt the judiciary. And he has shown zero interest in doing the courageous and visionary work required to pave the way for peace even before this present conflict. As a lifelong supporter of Israel, it has become clear to me the Netanyahu coalition no longer fits the needs of Israel after October 7th. The world has changed radically since then, and the Israeli people are being stifled right now by a governing vision that is stuck in the past. Okay. As I mentioned earlier, I don't really care all that much about the internal politics of which party in Israel is ruling the country. It doesn't, doesn't really interest me, certainly doesn't affect my day-to-day -day or even much of my geopolitical vision. But there's a lot of interesting stuff in that clip. For starters, you know, sometimes people who just reflexively don't like the Jews, they, they, they paint the Jews as this monolith. But here, obviously, they're not a monolith. Chuck Schumer's a Jew. He's calling on Bibi Netanyahu, who's also a Jew, to step down. And Schumer's saying Bibi Netanyahu's got to step down because Schumer supports the state of Israel. But Netanyahu and the Netanyahu supporters are going to say, no, Chuck Schumer, you dummy. You're, if we do what you say, then, then the state of Israel is going to stop existing because the Hamas people are going to get to run roughshod over us and we're not going to be able to defend ourselves. And so they're all arguing over who should lead, what they should do. So many of the pro-Palestine demonstrators in America are liberal Jews. So probably the most prominent critic of the state of Israel in the world is a Jew, Norman Finkelstein. So they're not, they just don't seem to be totally monolithic to me. And in, in this case, Chuck Schumer is the one who's coming out really leading the charge for Netanyahu to step down because he has some credibility, because he is a Jew. But then this raises another problem which is, haven't we just, in America, been lectured for eight years on the terrible, ter inexcusable threat to democracy caused by foreign election interference? 100 days away from the election, how worried are you on a scale of one to 10 about interference in the election? I'm very worried. They did it before. Um, it's a lot of whole, a lot of countries are trying to do it. We have to be prepared. We have to be guarded. We have to make sure they don't. There was less of it in 2018 than 2016, but no one knows if that's because some of these countries uh, decided to lay off uh, and give us a sense of complacency or not. But we should be ever vigilant, ever vigilant. This, if if people think that a foreign country helped determine our election and lose faith in our democracy, that's the beginning of the end of this grand experiment in democracy that's been so successful to, for more than 200 and some odd years. Okay, so foreign governments, let's try, to, let's try to take this apart. There's a lot, there's a lot there that Chuck Schumer just said. The foreign governments, the nefarious foreign governments that are undermining our democracy 
interfere in our elections, but only when Republicans win. When Republicans don't win, then they didn't interfere. But when Republicans do win, that is basically prima facie evidence that they did interfere. And in elections where the Republicans like win a little bit, but the Democrats win more, and then they didn't really only interfere a little. Why? They're laying low. Yeah, that's why. You see, they're laying low. They want us to let our guard down for until the next time a Republican wins, and then they definitely interfered. And, and, and here's the second point. Foreign interference in elections is really, really bad. It's an attack on the democracy of that country. Unless Chuck Schumer does it. When, when Chuck Schumer does it, you see, it's actually a great defense of democracy. Uh, actually, unless the Democrats broadly do it. Like when the Democrats send their political operatives to go to foreign countries and mess with their elections, like when Obama sends his campaign flax to try to boot Netanyahu out of Israel. When was that? That was nine years ago at this point. Or when Joe Biden sends his flax and his operatives to try to oust uh, Victor Orban in Hungary, a very popular democratically elected leader. No, that that's not foreign interference. That's not a threat to democracy. That's actually a defense of democracy. Because if the people are allowed to vote for the right-wing figures in foreign countries that they want to vote for, that would undermine the democracy. That's why we need to go in and either invade openly or just secretly kind of infiltrate their program and undermine the desires of the majority of the people of that country so that we can defend democracy. But if anyone does that to us in any way, that's that would be the end of democracy, you see. Pretty much democracy is whatever Chuck Schumer wants and Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi. Whatever they want ever on any subject anywhere in the world, that's democracy. And whatever they oppose is a grave grave threat. Hmm. Now, when you want to hire people, when you want to hire better people than, than the leaders that we have for, for our country, and you want to manage how they work for you, you ought to check out Ramp. Go to ramp.com slash Knowles. When you're running a business, time is money, honey. That's why I'm so excited to have Ramp as a new sponsor of this show. If you're a finance professional looking for a better way to maximize productivity and cut wasteful spending, then Ramp could be for you. Ramp is the corporate card and spend management software designed to help you save time and put money back in your pocket. With Ramp, you can issue cards to every employee with limits and restrictions, automate expense reporting, and stop wasting time at the end of every month. Ramp's accounting software automatically collects receipts and categorizes your expenses in real time so you don't have to. You will never have to chase down a receipt again, and your employees will no longer spend hours submitting expense reports. The time you'll save each month on employee expenses will allow you to close your books eight times faster. Ramp is easy to use. Whether you have five employees or 5,000, you can get started in less than 15 minutes. Get $250 when you join Ramp. Just go to ramp.com slash Knowles, K-N-W-L-E-S, spelled R-A-M-P dot com slash K-N-W-L-E-S. Ramp.com slash Knowles. Cards issued by Sutton Bank and Celtic Bank. Members of FDIC. Terms and conditions apply. Speaking of election interference, there's some real election interference going on in the Republican Party right now. But it's not being caused by the Russians, and it's not being caused by the Chinese, and it's not even being caused by the Democrats. It's an intra-Republican election interference. This is targeting my friend Lauren Boebert. Lauren Boebert is a member of Congress from Colorado. And, well, I'll, I'll take you through the timeline. There's another Colorado Republican member of Congress. His name is Ken Buck. Ken Buck said that he was going to retire at the end of this cycle. Now, Lauren, who won her race last time by a pretty tight margin, Lauren, who's dealt with a lot of attacks from the liberal media and scandals and all the rest of it, she decides she's going to run in Ken Buck's district. She's not going to have to primary him. He's going to leave. It's a, it's a more conservative place. She feels better off there running there than in her present district. So she's just going to run there for the next cycle. This happens. Uh, the, the districts change sometimes. The members of Congress will, they'll start out representing New York's 19th district. Then it turns out they represent New York's 18th district. And so, and just that sort of thing happens. However, when Lauren made clear that she was going to run for, for Ken Buck's old seat, Buck decides he's not going to serve the rest of his term. Buck is going to quit immediately, which triggers a special election. 
Now you'd say, okay, well, if it triggers, triggers a special election before the main election in November, then I guess Lauren can just run in the special election, right? Wrong. Because Lauren, who's the most visible candidate who would be running for that seat, would have to resign her current seat in Congress in order to run in the special election to replace Ken Buck because she's not going to be able to hold two seats in, in Congress. Okay, so then what? So now what's going to happen is there's going to be a special election on primary day and someone is going to be running in the special election to replace Buck, who's retiring early. And obviously for the next, for the next cycle, which is going to be coming up, months later. So then what happens? You've got th the most extreme version of having to split a ticket that you've ever seen. You vote for one guy to win the district in the special election and then vote for Lauren Boebert or whoever else you, you might want to elect there in the, the main election. Crazy. How did it happen? It's obviously a way to get Lauren out of Congress because a lot of people in the Republican Party don't like her, especially from the squishier wing of the party, don't like her. They fear, feel she's too outspoken. They feel she's too, you know, uh, eccentric. And so they want to get her out. Now, I'm not a voter in Colorado. I don't, I don't occupy either of these districts. The voters can make their own decision. Maybe there are other candidates. Lauren's the most visible one because she's a, a, a sitting member, but there are other people who are running for this seat. My only observation is that the fact that the establishment GOP is so hell-bent on getting her out of Congress that they would go to these extraordinary lengths to prevent her from winning re-election in November seems to be pretty decent evidence that we should keep her there. <laughs> that's, that's it. It's all, it's all I'm saying about Colorado. I don't know. The voters of Colorado can make their choice, but the, the squishy part of the GOP is really going to great lengths to get rid of this lady, which to me speaks in her favor. Speaking of Republican infighting, the former vice president to President Trump and current cycle presidential candidate, though he's obviously since dropped out, Mike Pence, was just asked, will you endorse Trump? Now that the primary is over, remember everyone at the, at the presidential debate signed that pledge saying they would support the eventual nominee. And then it seems a number of them are going back on that pledge. Ron DeSantis honored the pledge. A number, number are going back on it. Here's Mike Pence's answer. It should come as no surprise that I will not be endorsing Donald Trump this year. During my presidential campaign, I made it clear that there were profound differences uh, between me and, and President Trump on a range of issues. Donald Trump is pursuing and articulating an agenda that is at odds with the conservative agenda that, that we governed on during our four years. And that's why I cannot in good conscience uh, endorse Donald Trump in this campaign. Okay, fair enough. Those guys have some pretty personal beef. If I were Mike Pence, I probably would not be very happy with Donald Trump. Uh, so I get it. I get it. I, I totally understand. In as much as the, the Republican presidential candidates said they would back the eventual nominee, I guess they should do that. But I, I get it. I, at a personal level, I totally get why Mike Pence doesn't want to back this guy who went after him when he was serving with him, when Trump went after him pretty hard and effectively ended Pence's political career. I get it. Okay. That's a, that's a personal beef. It's not really a political argument. So again, I'm not judging Mike Pence at all. I totally understand. It, it's fine. What about the other guys? What about the other candidates? I'm not, I'm not talking about DeSantis here, but I'm talking about some of the other Republican presidential candidates who refuse to endorse Trump. What's their argument? What about some of the squishes, the liberal Republicans who seem like they'll either sit on their hands or might even consider voting for Biden? What's their excuse? Mitt Romney. I know, I get it. All these guys, they have a little bit of personal beef. With Pence, I think it's a little more intense, and Pence's, Pence's uh, anger at President Trump is a little bit more understandable than, say, someone like Mitt Romney. But what's their... Put the personal stuff aside. I don't care about their personal beef. I care about the, the direction of the country. For, for all these liberal Republicans who don't have intense personal <laughs> uh, grievances with regard to the president, What's the argument? I don't see one. I don't see any good 
argument, political argument involving policy, involving the public, involving the fight against Joe Biden and the Democrats. I don't see one good argument not to reelect Trump if you are in any way conservative, if you are in any way Republican. Barring some intense personal grievance, like you served the guy as vice president, you had a terrible falling out. I don't, what's the political argument? Can anyone articulate that to me? There are still some squish Republicans who are saying, oh, I don't, I'm not voting for this guy. I can't, I'm too angry about the primary. Okay, what's your, so your political argument is it's better for Biden to win? The country's better off if Biden wins? Give me a break. Totally ridiculous. Now, does that mean that everything Trump is saying is absolutely perfect? Does that mean that every policy that has been outlined is absolutely, but not exactly? No. Does that mean that Republicans are going to agree on everything? Certainly not. President Trump just recently and I, I think it's probably being overplayed by the media, but he turned off or at least raised red flags for some conservative voters in an interview he did on Fox News. If the Republicans spoke about it correctly, it never hurt me from the standpoint of elections. It, it hurt a lot of Republicans. Put a pause right here. I think you have to. What's he talking about? He's talking about abortion. I don't think it ever hurt me politically, but it has hurt Republicans politically. And so here's how I think we should talk about it in 2024. And no matter actually really what you think about abortion or what you think about Trump, everyone is going to find something to hate in this comment. You have to have the three exceptions because it's just, now there are a few places where you don't. But I tell people, number one, you have to go with your heart. You have to go with your heart. But beyond that, you also have to get elected. Okay. And if you don't have the three exceptions, I think it's very, very hard to get elected. We had a gentleman from Pennsylvania who was doing pretty well. He refused to go with the exceptions and he got, he lost in a landslide for governor. Nice man, lost in a landslide. You have to go with the exceptions and the uh, number of weeks, I'll be coming out with a recommendation fairly soon. I think the recommendation will be accepted. Okay. What is Trump saying here? He says, you got to go with your heart, but when it comes to abortion policy, you got to get elected. Uh, Mitch McConnell said something similar, just broadly speaking about political issues. He said, the winners go to Washington, the losers go home. So Trump says, politically, you got to go with the exceptions. Now, does this mean that the, the exceptions saying that uh, abortion is okay in the case of rape, incest, or threat to the life of the mother? And the last one is particularly tricky because the liberals interpret that to mean, you know, uh, a mother feels a little upset one day that she's pregnant, so that causes her such a psychological, not an actual threat to her life, but it causes her a, a emotional distress, so that justifies killing the baby. Obviously, you'd have to really circumscribe something like that. But what is, what is Trump doing here? Is he coming out and saying a baby who is conceived in, in a tragic way doesn't, doesn't have a right to life, that that's a lesser kind of human being? That is he making some grand philosophical or, or theological or anthropological point? No, obviously not. He, he, he makes it very clear, I think, in his language. He's saying, look, we're talking about abortion. If you, if you want pro-life policies, if you want pro-life judges, if you want to overrule Roe v. Wade, which is the biggest pro-life victory in 50 years, and it came about because of Trump's election and because of the judges that he picked and his, because he stood by those judges, he's saying, polit as a political matter, that's how you're going to have to talk about it. That part's probably not all that controversial. And there are, all, there are so many things to say about the principle of uh, double effect when we're talking about uh, the, uh, a threat to the life of the mother and, and all the rest of it. I've talked about abortion at length uh, recently. I, had, I gave a speech just last week at UW-Madison, which you can check out on the AF YouTube channel. But then he says something much more controversial, which is he says... Uh, when it comes to the number of weeks, we're going to release a policy soon. And I think everyone's going to be happy. Now, of course, <laughs> if you believe that life begins at conception, which by definition it does, and if you believe in defending vulnerable, innocent human life, then you, you can't just pick some arbitrary week. Okay, a baby should not be murdered at 15 weeks, but should be murdered at 14 weeks. Well, that doesn't make any sense. What's the argument for that? Oh, no, a baby at 24 weeks, that's a real baby. But the baby at 23 weeks and six days, chop him up, kill him. Of course not. That doesn't make any sense at all. But what is Trump talking about here? Again, I think a lot of people want to rush to the worst version of what Trump is saying. But Trump has a lot of credibility on this issue because in practice, he's the most, most pro-life president ever. 
He's the first one to address the March for Life. Even if you want to say, well, the other presidents didn't have the opportunity to overturn Roe v. Wade. Well, maybe they could have if they picked better judges. Trump did pick better judges. But two, why didn't they address the March for Life, huh? Why, did, why was Trump the first Republican president to do that? Because in practice, the guy's been the most pro-life president. But then what is he saying here? We're going to come to a compromise on, on the weeks. Well, if you take the, the worst possible read of that and say he's going to enshrine a right to kill a baby up until a certain amount of time, yeah, I guess that'd be really bad. As a federal matter, I thought the whole argument that was being made by, by the originalists was that we have to send the issue back to the states, not the federal government. Okay, if that's what he's saying, I guess that's pretty bad. What's your evidence that that's what he's saying? Mightn't it be the case that what he is advocating is not a minimum number of weeks at which you can kill a baby after which the states legislate, but perhaps a maximum? That would make sense. That would bring the United States much more in line with the, the rest of the civilized world. America has absolutely barbaric abortion policies. You think of places like France and uh, France, which, which enshrined abortion to some degree in their, in their constitution recently, or other parts of Europe, which have... have we think really awful abortion policies. Ours are much worse. At least there are limits in those places, national limits. America's abortion policies are, are barbaric on par with Canada, America's evil top hat, and North Korea and communist China, where there are basically no limits, at least in certain places. So what if when Trump is talking about this, he's saying, we're going we're gonna to have a, a maximum. So if we say 10 weeks or whatever it is, you know, to, uh, there's a, a 10 week abortion limit, that means that no one can pass an abortion, can pass a pro-abortion law that allows you to kill the baby after 10 weeks. But a conservative state like Tennessee, a conservative state like Texas or Alabama, you can pass a, a law banning it outright. What if that, I, I don't know. I'm not, I don't have evidence that that's what he's saying either. I'm, I'm just pointing out that I think is not only a more charitable read of what he's saying, but is, is probably a more likely read, at least constitutionally and legally and politically. And in that case, that would be a win. What the point that Trump is making here, which is that in politics, you got to you gotta take your wins when you can get them, and then you build on those wins. That is obviously true, and it's something that some conservatives don't want to acknowledge. They want all or nothing, and they get nothing. But if we can, if we can work with the most pro-life president in our lifetime to build on the win of overruling Roe v. Wade, to, to more and more chip away at the barbaric infanticide going on in the country— that's a win. And the way you do that is you got to win the elections. Then you win on the policy. Ladies and gentlemen, behold, the iconic leftist years tumbler is back, sending shivers down the spines, thrills up the legs of woke baristas everywhere. Now it is yours for free when you become a Daily Wire Plus annual member. That's right. Unlimited access to ad-free, uncensored shows from the Daily Wire hosts you love, hit movies and series, and groundbreaking documentaries on demand. That's all great. But what you've really been waiting for is the Leftist Years Tumblr. Now that's yours for free with an insider annual membership. Become an annual member today, dailywireplus.com, for your iconic, iconic Leftist Years Tumblr and drink to trigger the left. My favorite comment yesterday is from Hard Boiled Entertainment, who says, so just when lefties were sure that Willie was parked with them, he just had to get on the road again. Life I love is making music with my friends. So true. So true. I love a good pun. And Willie Nelson is defending Border Patrol, and that's a very good sign for 2024. Okay. Speaking of the libs, a new study. If you're driving, pull over. If you're standing up, sit down. This one's going to shock you. The study finds that people who have woke attitudes are more likely to suffer anxiety, depression, and unhappiness. What are the odds? A new... <laughs> I should do a series of just scientific studies that never needed to be conducted. <laughs> Huge wastes of time and money in laboratories and in academia because they tell you things that everyone just already knew through common sense. This new psychological assessment is detailed in the Scandinavian Journal of Psychology. Uh, it, it's a Finnish study. It finds out that there is a stronger alignment with uh, woke beliefs and heightened instances of anxiety and depression and overall unhappiness. Now, there is a caution here in the study, which is that these associations were more strongly correlated with the participants' political orientation than with critical social justice attitudes per se. What does that even mean? It's saying that the likelihood of anxiety and depression and unhappiness 
is uh, there's a greater likelihood just if you're a, a lib. And, and another indicator, though not as strong, is if you hold specific woke attitudes on specific woke issues. Yeah, d- okay. The, the two are synonymous. I guess if you identify as a big lib, then you're saying I embrace pretty much all of the, the woke views. So it's a stronger indicator that you're going to be anxious, depressed, and unhappy. But the upshot of the study is that the libs are basically nuts. And that's obviously true, and I don't mean it to be needlessly provocative. It's just a fact. Why is that the case? Because liberalism has a view of human nature and society that is at odds with reality in important ways. In the way the individual relates to his environment, in the importance of the family, in the way that our body relates to our soul, in uh, regard to our purpose in the world, how we relate to eternity and our creator and all, all the rest. The further that your ideology strays from reality, the more anxious and the less happy and the angrier you're going to be, the more depressed you're going to be. Because if you have a vision that is utopian, as I think liberalism is, then utopia means no place. You know Topia place, no place. You're not going to have it. And so when you can't achieve your political vision, you're going to be a little depressed, certainly. It, it, it stands to reason. If you're conservative, you're generally a little more content with reality. That's why you want to conserve it. You might not be content with your present political circumstances. I mean, uh, Joe Biden drives me up a wall, and I think he's a terrible president, and the liberal policies are awful. But I'm not ultimately anxious or depressed or unhappy because I recognize that even bad governance is part of a fallen world. And I try to take the wins when we can get them. I certainly push for the wins as hard as I possibly can. But I recognize it's a fallen world. I don't, I don't put my faith in princes. I don't put all my political hopes in the achievement of some egalitarian, totally liberated, utopian society. I wouldn't like it if we got that kind of a society. And frankly, I just know that we can. So it doesn't bug me when we don't. And and there's a lot of suffering that comes from the liberal political activism. But even that is kind of baked into my, my view. I don't like it, but I accept it and I expect it for that matter. The libs, they don't accept or expect any of those things. Just another s- survey, though. If you're a young person, you're encountering this video or this podcast, you're listening to it somewhere, and you're not all that political, or maybe you think you're liberal, you certainly don't think you're conservative. One good reason why you might consider exploring a conservative political view is the fact that you'll you'll more likely be happy if you're a conservative. The The proof of the pudding is in the tasting, okay? The tree is judged by its fruit. If these ideas are so good, why do they make people so miserable? If these liberal ideas are so wonderful and so beautiful, why do those views immiserate everyone who holds them? It's really strange. Really strange, huh? Maybe you got to change your mind. Okay. Speaking of jarring behavior, I'll end on this note. I remember, (laughs) remember last week we talked about Christy Nome, who is the Republican governor of South Dakota. And Christy Noem has done things that seem rather conservative at times, and she's done things that don't seem all that conservative, like when she caved on the <laughs> issue. Uh, a little bit of a mixed bag there. And she, one thing about Christy Noem, you, she's somewhat uh, unpredictable. So anyway, last week she did something really strange, which was that she did an infomercial for a dental clinic in Texas not even her state, Texas. And I thought, why is the sitting governor doing an infomercial for any business, much less one in a different state? And she got a lot of flack for it. It was really weird. We got no explanation for why the sitting governor of South Dakota is now a a, a dentistry pitch man. Well, without responding to any of the criticism, she just did another infomercial, this time at least for a South Dakota company, for, for custom insoles. We are at Fit My Feet in Rapid City, and these guys are amazing. They have totally built me inserts for running, separate ones for my cowboy boots. I'm going to be perfect. I'm going to be like bionic woman now, right? (laughs) Right. So come see these guys out in Rapid City. Actually, what towns are you in? Rapid City, Sioux Falls, Rochester, Minnesota, Fargo, North Dakota, Sioux City, Iowa, and Brookings. 
wait. I'm going to be amazing. <laughs> what? Uh, you know, I, I never want to overstate my case or my perspicacity or anything like that. When I, when I bring up a story, you, I said this last time she did this. I, when I bring up a story, usually I have a take on it. And I like to think it's a take that sheds more light on the issue than, you know, anyone else, because I don't want to just repeat what other people are saying. And I don't want to just bring up a story if, there's, if I have nothing to add to it. I have pretty much nothing to add to this. I have no idea <laughs> what would possess this woman <laughs> to keep doing infomercials for any company. Even you might say, well, she's promoting South Dakota business. I guess... But why is she promoting that insole business over the, the insole business competition of other South Dakotans? I don't, what is it? Here's some speculation. Here's the best I can muster. There was a lot of talk that Christy Nome was going to be Trump's running mate. And so this is pure speculation. I have no evidence of this whatsoever. Maybe she, she found out that she's not going to be the running mate. So She's throwing caution to the wind and doing all sorts of crazy things that one would expect would preclude her from being the running mate, which she was clearly gunning for and which uh, was uh, potentially on the table. I guess, I guess, I guess that's the best explanation I can hear. But the thing is, if that were the case, that would only explain why Christy Nome would not not do it. You know, uh, uh, the insole company says, we want you to be our pitch man. And she should say, well, actually, I'm being considered for vice president of the United States, so I can't become your pitch man dentistry company. And I, it would explain if, she, if, she, if, that, if that thing that she was hoping for, the running mate thing, if that were off the table, it would explain why she would not, not do the commercial. But why would she do it? She's a sitting governor. What, does she need the money? Does she need the fame? Does she... I don't know. It takes a very humble and handsome man to admit when he doesn't know something. And this is the one, this is the one story... That's come across the news in many months where I just think, I really, I don't know. And I'd be very curious to hear your explanation as to why the sitting governor of South Dakota is selling insoles in the comments section. There is no member block today because, speaking of Trump, I'm heading to Mar-a-Lago for an event for a group called Catholics for Catholics. Should be a lot of fun. Uh, if you're going to be at Mar-a-Lago tonight, I look forward to seeing you there. If you're not, I will be leaving President Trump's home, and I'll be back in the studio the following day. I guess that's tomorrow. Become a member. Use code Knowles, K-N-W-L-E-S, to check out for two months free on all annual plans.